Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of renal physiology, and this is recording part three. Now let's talk about hypokalemia, which can be defined as mild, moderate, or severe. Normal potassium levels are 3.5, so three to three and a half milli equivalents per liter is mild hypokalemia. Two and a half to three is moderate, and below two and a half is considered severe. Hypokalemia can be caused by decreased potassium intake or increased excretion or shifts of potassium from the extracellular to the intracellular space. Specific causes may include diarrhea, diuretic administration, hypomagnesemia, alkalosis, increased aldosterone, insulin, and beta-2 agonists. Signs and symptoms of hypokalemia are relatively nonspecific and may include weakness and muscle cramping. ECG changes would include flattened or inverted T waves and the presence of U waves. As with most electrolyte disturbances, chronic changes are better tolerated than acute changes. The treatment for hypokalemia is potassium supplementation, either by oral or IV routes, and this is appropriate when total body potassium is decreased. In general, potassium replacement is not urgent in cases of mild hypokalemia when patients have no symptoms or signs. There is data that suggests patients with coronary artery disease may benefit from maintaining serum potassium above 4 milliequivalents per liter. And in general, oral potassium supplementation is preferable to intravenous, re intravenous replacement. When we do give intravenous potassium, the recommendation is no faster than 10 milliequivalents per hour, and certainly not faster than 0.5 milliequivalents per kilogram per hour. Total IV potassium replacement should be limited to 250 milliequivalents per day. Ideally, it should be given through a central line because potassium burns when infused through a peripheral IV. If you do give it peripherally, it needs to be given slowly and preferably at a lower concentration. Continuous ECG monitoring is recommended when giving IV potassium. As a general rule of thumb, 10 milliequivalents of potassium chloride will increase serum potassium levels by about 0.1 milliequivalents per liter although it can take several hours for levels to equilibrate and redistribute to the intracellular space. One must also treat any concurrent hypomagnesemia when treating hypokalemia. When should surgery be canceled or postponed due to hypokalemia? This depends on the cause of hypokalemia, whether it is acute versus chronic, and any other coexisting diseases or risks for arrhythmia that exist in this patient. No clear threshold has been defined, according to most textbooks. We know that when serum potassium is below 3.5 milliequivalents per liter in cardiac surgical patients, there is an association with an increased incidence of perioperative dysrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. The most important thing to appreciate is that since almost all potassium in the body is in the intracellular fluid, a one milliequivalent per liter decrease in extracellular fluid potassium correlates with a total body potassium deficit of at least 200 to 400 milliequivalents, which may require several days of treatment to replenish. Calcium is going to be discussed in more detail when we go to the endocrine section and talk about parathyroid hormone. But just briefly, cells in the proximal tubule are responsible for calcium secretion. Parathyroid hormone acts here and it increases your renal tubular calcium reabsorption. There's a calcium ATPase pump. There's also a calcium sodium countertransport mechanism. And usually what we see is calcium follows sodium and water. If a patient has very high phosphate levels, that will stimulate parathyroid hormone to increase calcium reabsorption. And patients who have alkalosis will also have increased calcium reabsorption.
Phosphate is usually reabsorbed in the proximal tubule at a rate of up to about 0.1 millimoles per minute. Any excess phosphate is excreted, and normal phosphate in the serum is 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter, or 0.81 to 1.45 millimoles per liter. Just a reminder, and again, we'll discuss this in detail in the endocrine section, parathyroid hormone increases bone resorption in order to increase your plasma phosphate, and it decreases your renal phosphate reabsorption in order to increase phosphate excretion. If patients have hyperphosphatemia, this can be caused by kidney disease, hypoparathyroidism, acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, or phosphate enemas that people may be using. The signs and symptoms are pretty similar to the symptoms of hypocalcemia, which again we'll discuss later on in endocrine. And the treatment is usually some phosphate binding medications. Hypophosphatemia occurs in patients who are alcoholics, burned, or starving, as well as patients who take diuretics, who have alkalosis, or who take a lot of aluminum-containing antacids. Signs and symptoms include weakness to the point of respiratory failure and heart failure. The treatment is supplementation with oral or IV phosphate. Usually we give about 0.5 millimoles per kilogram of KFOS over six hours. Now we get to magnesium, which is very important in the action of lots of enzymes and also in your potassium and calcium metabolism. About half of your body's magnesium resides in your cells. The other half is in your bones, and only a very tiny percentage is in your extracellular fluid. And of the magnesium in your extracellular fluid, half of it is protein-bound. So after all that, your normal serum magnesium is usually 1.8 to 2.6 milligrams per deciliter. Patients can become hypomagnesemic if they have a lot of GI losses, say from diarrhea, or poor nutritional intake, or if they take a lot of diuretics. Signs and symptoms may include anorexia, nausea, vomiting, lethargy, and weakness. At higher, uh, at more extreme levels of hypomagnesemia, patients can start to develop tetanus, tremors, muscle fasciculations, and even seizures. Often you will see hypocalcemia and hypokalemia as well. The treatment is to supplement with oral or IV magnesium. Usually we give magnesium sulfate, 2 grams IV. It can be given relatively quickly, over 15 minutes or even faster if needed. Now hypermagnesemia can be caused by renal failure, ingestion of magnesium, which could be common in patients taking oral antacids, or patients who are receiving magnesium therapy in the hospital or as a form of medication. Signs and symptoms of hypermagnesemia are primarily decreased uh, reflexes, and this starts at a magnesium level of about 4 to 6 milliequivalents per deciliter, which is uh, also 4.8 to 7.2 milligrams per deciliter. As the hypermagnesemia becomes more severe, Patients may develop hypotension, complete loss of reflexes, general muscle weakness, respiratory depression, and eventually cardiac arrest. These severe symptoms tend to occur above about 10 milliequivalents per deciliter or 12 milligrams per deciliter. Treatment of hypermagnesemia, if it is severe, would be IV calcium, which helps prevent cardiac toxicity, similar to what we saw with elevated potassium levels. Diuretics can be used to increase excretion of magnesium, and if the situation is severe enough, dialysis may be necessary. We'll stop here. As always, please let me know if you have any questions about the material.